Anamantido, Anamnaguija, lo ni hermano, The connection between sea and soul for Celtic peoples has been a prominent theme in Irish literature for hundreds of years. On this episode of Conversations on Inares, we talk with an Irish historian who has been examining ancient Irish tales of sea voyages. The Imirama literally means tales of rowing about, and he finds within them the seeds of a unique vision of speculative thinking he calls Celtic futurism. Many of these Imarama stories date back to the 7th and 8th century CE, and they detail journeys to faraway spiritual lands with mystical elements and fantastic creatures. My name is Joseph Orozco, and I'm the director of the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. My guest today is Dr. Christopher Lachlan. Dr. Lachlan has been a contributor to the Inares Project for many years, writing on our blog about Irish politics and solidarity with global liberation struggles. He's a labor historian of modern Britain and Ireland. He was employed as a lecturer in history at Newcastle University from 2018 to 2021, and he obtained his training at Queen's University, Belfast. His first monograph, Labor and the Politics of Disloyalty in Belfast, 1921 to 1939, was published in 2018. He has also published work on civil rights, loyalty, and the foundations of Northern Ireland, gender, sexualities, and industrial relationships. Lately, Lachlan has been involved with critical science fiction studies on the power and dialectics of 20th century science fiction and what he calls Celtic futurism. His work has recently appeared in the Rutledge Handbook of Literature and Class and the Science Fiction Research Association Review. We asked him to come to talk to us about foundations of Celtic futurism and how this perspective can help us to think about the future of Ireland, but also the connections of the Irish struggle with other forms of speculative thinking, such as Afrofuturism, and ways of struggle against imperialism and neocolonialism. Let's now turn to our discussion with Dr. Christopher Lachlan. All right, we're here now with uh, Dr. Christopher Lachlan. Uh, Dr. Lachlan, thank you for being here today on Conversations on an RS. No problem at all. A pleasure to be here. So thank you yeah. so much for inviting me on to speak. No, it's been uh, it's been an honor to uh, know you for a few years here. You've collaborated with the Inares Project before. We have some of your uh, work on our website, but this is the first time we've had a chance actually to have a conversation uh, about uh, some of the themes that we like to talk about here in the program. So I'm uh, excited to talk with you about this idea of Celtic futurism that you have in your work. Um, before we get started, though, with talking about uh, some of the recent research that you've been doing, um, I'd like to talk uh, in general about you as a, a fan of speculative fiction. Uh, is this a, a, a genre of, of literature that, uh, or a film, pop culture that, that you're a fan of in general? Uh, did you come to speculative fiction uh, as someone, uh, as a fan? Oh, definitely, definitely. Like, that's the thing where even I'm thinking about just speculative fiction in general no I've been from as long as I can kind of remember I've been a fan of you know the kind of terms and ideas involved in speculative fiction so things like time travel and alternative societies in general and like the what's called the, the thing that I always go back to with students whenever I'm teaching about Irish history and stuff like that is always Bill and Ted that's the first thing I can kind of remember as a kid because I remember the films came out when I was maybe five years old yeah. And I remember seeing the, the companion cartoon series that was done along with Bill and Ted. And that really completely like ignited my imagination as a little kid. I think like that's one of the, it's one of the things that I, oh, reason I always talk to students about is just because I think that's probably where me wanting to go into history and writing about history kind of really comes from. Oh, from that kind of an early, early age. But the other thing that I was thinking about, which um, it took me, it was only whenever this came out again years ago when they redid this series that I was like, I remember watching that as a kid and it's The Handmaid's Tale. 
I remember when I was back at primary school, maybe going into secondary school, so I was 10 or 11, whenever I first saw the 1990 film adaptation yeah. of The Handmaid's Tale. And I remember seeing as a kid and never knowing what that film was about or what it was actually called. But yeah. then years later, seeing The Handmaid's Tale, going, that was the film as well. And it's Natasha Richardson mm -hmm. is the uh, plays Alfred in the um, in that original version. And just she's she was married to Liam Neeson. Yeah. So there's also a wee little Irish link going That's on right. there as well right. with the Handmaid's Tale, you know. But no, no, so speculative fiction, science fiction in general, being a big fan of as from the earliest kind of age, and especially like Warhammer 40,000, Grimdark, that kind of science fiction. Oh, yeah. It's very important just because that's that as a science fiction kind of area and idea is really important in Britain and Ireland and has been very significant. It's not so much as big over your side of the pond, yeah. but it is very important actually over in, in Britain, essentially in Ireland, about those kind of things. And so that kind of introduced me to people like Heinlein and then oh, yeah. like people like Asimov and stuff like that as well. And the general kind of science fiction, you know, in general, kind of introduced me to that yeah. kind of stuff. So as long as I can kind of remember. Yeah, really the classics. Yeah, uh, is there uh, amongst those kind of classics? Are there are there ones that you're particularly drawn to that you like, uh, uh, and uh, why? Well, recently, recently it's been, and over the past ten years, it's really been Ursula Le Guin's work. Oh, good, has been the kind of key thing that I've been kind of looking at, especially speculative fiction, just because it's such fantastic um, storytelling. I think that's really what attracted me to her as a writer, and then realizing, whoa, actually, there's so many. Um, you know, radical and critical kind of theory ideas underpinning a lot of her work and things like that as well. That's really been the kind of stuff. And also China Meville. Don't know if you've read much of his stuff or anything like that, but China Meville is really good. There's a great, great book uh, by China Meville called The City and the City. And you're like, I've seen, I've watched a lot of TV programs about the North of Ireland because that's where I'm from, you know, and about the troubles and about divided society and stuff like that. And one of the best you know, fiction or non-fiction representations of a divided society is the city and the city. It's such a good explanation, actually, of what it means to live in a really strictly kind of divided society like that. And in a kind of a nuanced kind of a way, it talks about those kind of things because it's going to be very ham-fisted a lot of those kind of things. Like one of the, the, the things that um, a lot of people I know of my generation, Captain Planet, the kind of eco-warrior series from back when I was a child, there's an hilarious episode of that set in Northern Ireland that's all about the Troubles and them trying to stop a nuclear explosion in Belfast. And it's still, you can see the, the clip on YouTube about it, actually, about that episode, and it still is like a source of hilarity to my generation and the people who lived through Captain Planet and that era of Northern Ireland's history. They kind of watch that to see how we were kind of drawn internationally, and how it's kind of seen as, a, you know, like a very dark place and a very, uh, what's called, divided place. And so it's kind of funny. It kind of has a lot of, there's a lot of stage Irishry. It's kind yeah. of what it's called in literary terms. There's a lot of stage Irishry in that Captain Planet and like in a what called in a quite ham fisted way, but it, it's from the right place. I kind of think that Captain Planet approach to it as well. But those are the kind of things recently that I would kind of say that have been really kind of um, important to my work. But one of the other areas that I'm planning to look at and I'm doing the research for at the moment is about the role of history and fantasy, mm -hmm. and really about the philosophy of history that goes on in fantasy because that's one of the things that I've noticed about Martin's work. But especially Tolkien's work is that one of the reasons I think it works so well as fantasy is the history that's underpinning all of it. And so there's a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the history that's in Tolkien, for example, is so realistic, is so um, consistent with the world that he's created that then the illusion of the fantasy is very, very strong and is very, very deep. So that's kind of where another angle of this kind of work is also going um, towards as well, and especially because of the idea of mythology mm -hmm. and mythologies in general. And so that's where this kind of the, the, the work after this Celtic futurism is moving towards as well, but also planning to look more at the Celtic futurism itself as well and things like that. The other that's kind great. of aspect... Yeah, well, let's get into this this, this, this yeah. idea of, of Celtic futurism, uh, some of your recent work. <clears throat> so, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're very interested in the interplay between speculative imagination and history. And some of your recent work has been looking at um, uh, medieval Irish tales. Um, so 
before we sort of get into this, the specifics of uh, your work in Celtic Futurism, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you understand the idea of science fiction as a genre. Um, for, for you, what is science fiction? What does it attempt to do as a form of literature? Well, that's, I think it's a really great kind of question. And the most, the most important kind of work on science fiction, and it's about defining the genre, I think, is really Darko Suvin's work about cognitive estrangement and the idea about a novum, and the idea about newness in that sense. And that's where, like, that's where my own definition of it, I really kind of come down or it would boil down to that kind of idea about the cognitive estrangement that's going on and about the, you know, the strangeness that's going on about the kind of alienation that's kind of going on and not necessarily in like the block sense or in the uh, Bertolt Brecht kind of sense, but alienation in more of that generalized sense. So that I suppose the non Marxist sense of alienation of just that it's different, it's other in that kind of sense. And that to me is really the kind of the cornerstone of what I would be defining science fiction as, as being, because obviously the, the wider history of science fiction um you know, we would talk about those aspects, about it being a 20th century phenomenon in terms of that golden age definition of where science fiction came from. But then also all this is work, you know, about um, Frankenstein and about um, Edgar Allan Poe and Jules Verne and people like that. And the 19th century kind of history about it. And just that aspect about the 19th and the 20th century aspects of um, science fiction, I think, is important just because my own training as an historian was as a modernist. So all my training was very much on the idea, and like the undergraduate degree I did, it was 1500 to 1950, essentially. That was our, what we were considered, that's modern history, and that's it. And so you weren't really then introduced to medieval history, you weren't really introduced into any kind of ancient understandings about these kind of things. And that's where the, the fictional element of speculative fiction and science fiction is very important actually, I think now, and especially for authors like Suvin and for that generation of the, of the new wave authors kind of emerge from that to stress more of those aspects of the fiction that's kind of going on. And like, that's where some of the ideas then about the Celtic futurism is coming in are about those ideas about time, because that was one of the things I kind of noticed then beginning to work, you know, to read Adam Roberts's work about this and about proto-science fiction and about a longer history to science fiction, because I think there's a big argument to be made for that poor speculative fiction and science fiction as a whole, that there is a longer history, these kind of ideas. And it's just the the work I did a couple of years ago about um, power in science fiction and about the robot, that was one of the things that I kind of noticed about that that's really kind of significant, I kind of think, is that the role that humans are put in towards the robot, towards the android, or towards AI, the role that we're put in in that situation is akin to God creating humans. And it's just that that idea about, well, okay, if we're thinking about God creating humans and the way that's drawn in the, in the, the general monotheisms throughout the world, well, then there's already kind of templates about the creation of life. And that's kind of one of the aspects and ideas that I would kind of talk about for then a definition of science fiction is that actually science fiction, it's a mythology of modernity. In those kind of senses, I would kind of kind of think about and talk about in the sense that it's taking older stories, but recasting them in our time and recasting them with technology, recasting them with our approaches to society in that kind of sense. And it was just as I was doing that research about the robot, I kind of realized that, yeah, there's a lot, there is a lot longer kind of history, these kind of things. I like what Adam Roberts talks about, that there is a much longer history to these fantastical voyages, for example but also with ideas about the creation of, of human beings themselves. And just the, one of the, the reasons why that's so significant is just Tolkien talks about that with fantasy. So he talks in his fantasy about that that's why fantasy authors and human beings can create worlds is because they're the reflection of God. And so God created the world and we can create many worlds. So there's also kind of, there's also kind of links, I think, there about in theological kind of terms, but then in secular terms, about how we understand those kind of things and how other authors may have talked about those kind of things as well. So that's where the, the kind of sprawling definition, I guess, I would give about science fiction and where it kind of comes from. So it's this kind of it's this kind of literature that 
uh, as you were putting it, using Subin's de definition, it's it's something that throws us out from our, our 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 real life that allows our imagination to consider aspects of world creation, of power, of human nature, uh, the the relationship of human beings to creation or to subordinates, right? So it it it, it creates this whole sort of um, sort of play field for lots of different kinds of moves of the imagination. Exactly. And it's that openness. That's what really, as, as I guess I probably should have started with that actually when we began to talk, I should have started with that idea about openness mm -hmm. because that's where the, that time travel, the Bill and Ted are doing. There's an openness about the history that you can yeah, go back yeah. and see, the history, see what the history is kind of like. And I think that's why science fiction, speculative fiction, why they appeal in our time period, especially, or in our world right now, why they appeal is because they are so open about those kind of things. And you can you can play with those ideas. And that's very important. I kind of think for futures, for what happens in the future, that we do play with these kind of kind of things. There's a great William Blake line from the Proverbs of Hell where he talks about you know that that everything that was once ima once imagined is now true. And there's so many kind of examples of that from science fiction literature, you know, where they've talked about this is what the future might look like. And ergo, and it does end up looking a bit like that or bits yeah. of technology that Asimov would have written about, you know, that you could carry around knowledge in your pocket. But you kind of read about it and you go, well, that's obviously a phone. That's obviously a tablet. Yeah. There's yeah. things like that. You yeah. know, that kind of thing. And that's where it kind of appeals as a, as a genre and why, why, it, you know, why it's appealing to audiences, but also why it's appealing to authors. To write about those kind of things because it does give that that openness and a lot of my work would be very influenced by Jacques Rancière's uh -huh. work about the distribution of the sensible and about the practice of equality and I think there's a lot of things like that where you can see practices of equality going on in science fiction in terms of the way that it treats the um the reader you know that the reader is kind of given the free reign to understand uh, that kind of yeah, sense you don't yeah. um, talk down to I suppose in that kind of kind of sense you're kind of inviting the reader and the audiences to come along with him and to adventure in those kind of places, you know? Well, let's talk about adventure uh, because this is something that you've been uh, focusing on with your work in um, uh, Celtic Futurism. So the, the the work that you're looking at with, with uh, some of these medieval uh, Irish tales is that they're tales of voyages, uh, sea voyages. And what you've tried to argue in some of these tales, uh, because there's, apparently there's a whole genre of these Irish uh, sea tales, uh, you believe that they should count as proto-science fiction. So I was wondering if you could introduce us to what these tales are and why you think they demonstrate some of the features of science fiction as you've been talking about them. Okay, well, well the whole, there's a whole genre of literature um, of Irish, you know, literature from that medieval period, um, and the the seafarer, seafarer tales, the Imrama, and it, the the literal translation of that Imrama is it translates into rowing about, and so essentially they're just tales about um, specifically going on the sea and voyaging somewhere on the sea because there's, there's other genres of tales within the medieval canon, such as the Ectri, which are like the adventure tales. So tales where you stay on land, but you go on a fantastical adventure or you go and visit the other world. You go and visit the underworld. You go and visit life after death. There's lots of stories like that as well. And the Imrama then are a specific kind of category of those wider Irish uh, medieval tales. And, and one of the, the reasons why it's, why it's significant is just before the Christianization of Ireland, which is the 5th and the 6th centuries A.D., the Romans, you know, never conquered and never um, occupied Ireland or anything like that. And so literization, the actual writing down of Gaelic as a language, the Irish language, begins with those um, Christian monks. And it's because the, you know, like the religious um, groups, the religious elite in Ireland at that stage would have been, like other areas of Europe before the Romans or the Greeks, would have considered writing to be heretical, essentially. So it all had to be memorized. Everything had to be, you know, understood. And all the, you know, the the Thiele, the poets, for example, all would have memorized all their poems and things like that. And it's just that's where then why we have the Amrama as they are is because you have these Christian monks and monasteries where they actually begin to write down these things. And one of the fascinating things about this is that in the recent archaeology, the last ten years, 
It used to be claimed that the Romans had no influence on Ireland, but they found a Roman villa, the remains of a Roman villa outside Dublin, um, near Wicklow, I think it is, about 10 years ago, 2014, they found this archaeological evidence. So we now know that at least the Romans had a cultural influence over Ireland. And that, that, and that there may have been Romans that lived in Ireland at, at some stage, but they didn't leave much behind, or they never occupied it, they were never successful there. And so those Imrama are then written down by the by the Christian monks. Um, and we have the Imrama themselves. We know in the from the medieval manuscripts that there's eight Imrama altogether. There's eight titles of Imrama, but we only actually have four Imrama. Um, translated and left today that are in the manuscript sources. And one of the reasons why why we have you know, so few manuscript sources or why we only have half of them is to do with the colonialism and the imperialism in Ireland. So whenever Ireland's then occupied by the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century, they would have been very, um, they would have had a very derogatory attitude towards the Irish that are already there and seen them as being barbarians, essentially. And that becomes especially then violent in the Tudor and the Stuart reconquests of Ireland in the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries. And so that's why we don't have as many tales as we would kind of think about or would want. And so the Amrama themselves, the, the earliest kind of example of an Amrama that we can really kind of talk about or that's seen in the secondary literature as being an Amrama is the navigation of St. Brendan. And so the navigation of St. Brendan is a very famous medieval manuscript source all about um, the voyages of St. Brendan um, on the sea, especially. And there's two stories that become amalgamated into that voyage of St. Brendan. One's the original voyage of St. Brendan, and the other is the Vita Brendani, which is the life of Brendan. And essentially in that tale of Brendan, he visits a lot of fantastical places. He visits an island of enormous sheep, a mobile island, which is a giant fish or a whale, an island of birds. Um, uh, there's an island that has, you know, like the earthly form of angels on as well. And they go to visions of heaven and hell. They journey and visit, uh, you know, a pious hermit named Paul and also visit Judas Iscariot in hell as well. And so that fantastical voyage, we think, or the secondary literature thinks that's the earliest kind of voyaging about tale that we know of. And then you get the Irish Voyager tales themselves, such as Imra Coorig Maeldun, which is the Voyager rowing about of Maeldun. And Maeldun, his um, voyage kind of replicates a lot of the ideas from um, St. Brendan's voyage, but there's a lot more, there's a bigger pagan element in the voyage of Maeldun. So he essentially begins and goes on the journey because the Druids tell him that he has to avenge the death of his father. And has to go and find the people that have killed um, his father and everything like that. And then because he takes his foster brothers with him, it puts him over the number of voyagers he should be going with. And because of that, he then ends up on a, like a, a seven year voyage across different islands. And again, visits some of the similar types of islands as Brendan is supposed to have visited um, as well. So you get lots of um, like there's an island of a giant horse race. There's an, I there's an island with giant ants. On it as well. There's an island with a giant woman that they visit, and also an island, and um, the Tiernamon, it's called, which is the island of women purely. And that's where they're kind of supposed to be. It takes them a while to eventually leave that island because they're supposed to be um they're supposed to be sirens essentially that keep them there, you know, that are um taking them from what they're supposed to do with their voyage. And there's lots of fantastical places that male do and visits, and there's 40 different islands, so it's a quite a long tale about those kind of things. And eventually it ends in a similar kind of way that Brendan ends in the sense that he comes to um, an island with a hermit on it and with a pious hermit who then tells him that instead of killing his father's murderers, he should forgive them. And so there's a really strong Christian um, allegory going on um, in it. And that's where kind of like one of the major debates about these Imrama and medieval tales kind of comes from is whether they're um, kind of domestic Irish productions or whether they're really sort of Christian productions that have been coming and whether they express kind of Christianization in that kind of sense. And there's probably no definitive answer, I suspect, to those kind of things about whether they are pagan or Christian. They're hybrids. Essentially, they're, they're combining elements um, about those kind of ideas. Well, that's kind of where 
what those kind of Imrama are as tales. And the other Irish Voyager tales, the, the Voyage of Bran is the most famous other one, Imran Brain Meg Fable. It's called um, The Voyage of Bran, The Son of Fable. And just in that tale in particular, one of the kind of fascinating things I kind of find about it is that they're supposed to be on the voyage for five years in the voyage of Bran. But when they get back to Ireland, it's supposed to be 300 years have passed. So when they get back to Ireland, nobody recognizes them. And they all kind of say, well, well, we remember somebody from one of our stories about a Bran who went on a sea journey, but we don't know who you are. And so there's kind of, there's fascinating kind of plays with time. And just the reason why that play with time, I think is so important is as a modernist, as someone that's kind of brought up and was trained in very much like the modernity being the key difference is when you come across the conceptions of time they're using, you begin to kind of realize, whoa, okay. So their versions of time are more complex than modernists would kind of give them credit for. There's a, there's a very famous book by Brendan um, Anderson called Imagined Communities. And time is one of the key things he talks about, about why modernity is different to the medieval world, is our conceptions of time that they didn't really have the conception of time we would um, recognize. And it was as I was kind of reading those Imrama, I kind of realized, well, that's, that, that maybe gives them, it maybe puts us, um, we're, we're, it makes us think that we're more intelligent than we are and makes us think that maybe people were stupider than they were. And I kind of think that's, you know, maybe that is kind of a problem of modernism and a problem of modernist kind of trained people about these kind of things um, as well. And the last other kind of thing about, there's other, the two other Imrama are the Snegusa August Mag Regla and the Imram Kurug Okora are the two other Imrama. And I haven't looked at those in any depth at all. That's kind of what I'm planning to look at more is, um, is about that. And sort of where then those Imrama come in or why those Imrama are kind of important is just the wider definitions of science fiction. So, for example, what Nichols says about this is he gives five, you know, he gives five elements that he says are science fiction. There's the fantastical voyage, there's the utopia and the dystopia, the philosophical tale, the gothic, and the technological and sociological anticipation. And it's just all of those imrama all have elements of those going on and in different kind of ways. So, for example, that idea about the seafaring and about going and adventuring on the kind of sea, that is kind of the horizon of their, of where they would kind of see, of the unknown, is essentially that sea, but also the technology of seafaring, the technology of these kind of things. The Gothic, that medieval period, is where we kind of get our architectural understandings of the Gothic, quote-unquote, from. And then philosophical tales, utopia and dystopia, there's lots of examples of that utopia and dystopia going on in the Amrama themselves. And obviously they all are fantastical voyages. And it's just the other aspect with those then Amrama that I've realized doing more research about the Amrama is that whenever you begin to think about those magical and fantastical elements that are going on, there's lots of magical and fantastical elements going on throughout all of the um, Irish medieval tales. So the cattle raid of Cooley, the Tain, is the most famous bit of Irish uh, medieval literature. But in that, you have the cauldron that never goes um, empty, you know, and it creates like superhuman warriors. It revives warriors who are dead. There's lots of fantastical um, elements kind of going on. That. And it's, it's one of the reasons why Irish literature especially has been such a, it's such a rich kind of vein or it's such a rich kind of area and, and idea literary in literary terms to look at. But it's somewhere, and it's, these Irish medieval tales have really been overlooked and it's because they're in a vernacular because they're not in English is essentially why these tales were kind of overlooked. And it is, you know, that, that longer term history of imperialism and colonialism, I would say it's just, and the nation state, those are probably the reasons why these kind of Imrama are not seen. And especially like why Adam Roberts in his book, you know, says there's a thousand year hiatus between the fantastical voyage in the Greco-Roman world and then the early modern like reinvention of that fantastical voyage. I think it is just to do with that Anglophone kind of nature of where he's from and the kind of culture he's grew up in, that it kind of just misses out the vernaculars about these kind of things. And that's where the kind of sympathy of these kind of ideas, I think, kind of comes from internationally with other areas as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know? I, was, I wonder, a uh, yeah, question to ask about this is, are the Umrah, are they, do they all have a... 
moral of the story at the end? Are they all sort of meant to be edifying stories in some way that uh, teach the 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 reader some kind of or the listener some kind of um, moral ethical lesson? No, no, they they do. As far as they're written down, and we have those sources. They all have those allegories at the end. They're all very strongly Christian allegories about that. And that's where that that issue about the Christian monks being the people to write these down comes in, because that's where a lot of the debate in the secondary literature kind of comes from, is, well, are these really pagan stories that were then Christianized, or were they Christian stories that have pagan overhangs going on them? And we'll probably never know exactly what the relationship was, but there is definitely... Um, you know, sorry, they are all Christian allegories in that kind of sense, but it's not sort of definitively clear whether they were Christian allegories when they're told originally or whether that was added to them then by the Christian monks kind of reading them in that kind of um, sense as well. And so just the, the, the other issue about that colonialism and imperialism comes in because whenever you, in Irish history, it's very controversial about the issue of imperialism and about colonialism as a whole. But when you begin to kind of think about it, you know, you begin to kind of kind of think, well, okay, is Christianization itself a form of colonialism and a form of imperialism that comes to Ireland at a certain stage? I mean, we know that the um, the Norse invasions, the Viking invasions from the eighth century, are essentially involving some form of colonialism. The Anglo-Norman invasions in the eleventh and the twelfth centuries are involving something like that. So, in the you know the medieval literature and in the Irish history it's kind of accepted that there's at least two um, colonialist, imperialist occupations of Ireland. But I would I would say from looking at the Amarama and thinking about these tales that there's arguments to be made that there's a few colonialisms and imperialisms that have affected Ireland in different, in different kind of ways. And so that that's then also kind of an issue about these kind of things to think about is what role that may have played in these kind of ideas and these kind of stories as well, you know? That's fascinating. Well, part of what, I mean, you know, in talking about some of these the 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 neglect of some of these stories because of a certain colonial perspective in the history of science fiction um you know part of what your work has been doing is to sort of bring attention to these these voyage tales but but and also to situate them in a, a framework of a larger uh grouping called celtic futurism so i was wondering this is a term that i was not familiar with before i came across your work and so i wanted to ask could you in some sense, explain what Celtic futurism is, and how do you think that your your investigation of these voyage tales fits part of that uh, that constellation of ideas that's known now as Celtic futurism? Well, first of all, the kind of thing that I would kind of talk about with it would be the qualification. So this is still work that I'm kind of researching through and thinking about and developing myself as well. So I would really see it as or kind of would first qualify it by kind of saying that it's, it's an invitation to think about these kind of ideas and to deal with these kind of um, terms and to think about how um, other societies, how previous societies in Ireland and part of the kind of the wider um, you know Atlantic world that we're kind of part of in that sense, how they've then thought about these kind of ideas. And like where this term Celtic futurism comes from is from um, its Ap Diefrig's work about Kimrody Fodlith, which is the Welsh um, for Celtic futurism or Welsh futurism. And he's a, a media theorist, Ap Diffrig, who's written about this. And he was really talking about it in the terms of how Welsh society deals with the internet, how Welsh society, how, you know, how Welsh speakers in Wales think about these kind of um, ideas and think about how you know, modern technology is shaping Welsh society and approaches to these and it was just from coming across his work and thinking about that idea of a Welsh futurism that then I was kind of thinking about well if there's a proto science fiction if there are voyager tales in Ireland that are proto science fiction like that well then perhaps there's a Celtic futurism as well and the second thing that's so important about this to then realize is that I'm not using Celtic in a biological sense or in a racial sense so you know 18th, 19th, 20th centuries histories in Ireland and abroad are very much shaped by this idea that there is a Celt and that there was a Celtic um, race and that this Celtic race was, you know, was oppressed and was defeated by the Romans. 
and then becomes like amalgamated into wider and um, Western societies. The, the latest, you know, the archaeological work that's been done over the past 10, 20 years by Barry Cunliffe, there's a professor over here, an archaeologist, about this. He's proven that you can't talk about the Celts or Celticism as a biological marker. It's not a race, but it is a linguistic marker. That you know, the ancient writers, people like Julius Caesar, for example, used the term Celt, and, and we think they probably used the term about themselves as Celts too, but that actually it's a linguistic grouping. And it's a linguistic grouping that then um, then occurs across Western Europe and across Northern Europe. So it would have been the Celts would have been peoples living and speaking Celtic languages across German, modern day Germany, Northern Italy, Spain, France, Ireland, Wales, England, Britain, all those areas. And so that's where the idea of Celtic futurism, it's a linguistic marker. That's what I would kind of talk about it. And that and this is where this then becomes why the invitation is important to think about this or why it's an open field to talk about this in this kind of sense is because these tales that we're talking about as Imrama, as Irish, as Celtic futurism, there are those same tales recur in other Celtic cultures or other cultures that we would consider Celtic. So like in the Welsh culture in Wales, in the Cornish in um, the southwest of England, the Bretons in the north of France, and um, Manx on the Isle of Man, and also Scottish Gaelic. And it's just there's a two, there's two different languages. Well, there's two different ver- Celtic languages that really then kind of emerged. And one of them is P-Celtic, which is um, Gallo-Britannic, or Gallo-Brithonic, sorry, which is what the Welsh, the Cornish, and the Bretons are descended from. Whereas the Q-Celtic is what Old Irish, Manx, and Scottish Gaelic are all descended from. So that's where that then idea of Celtic futurism, as I'm kind of saying that it's a, an open invitation, I kind of think it is, there's more, a lot more work to be done thinking about then how those other societies we would consider as being broadly Celtic or that are within that same linguistic groupings, how they play with these ideas of Voyager tales and how they use them um, as well. And so that's so, so where do you see reflections of of uh, the sort of these Irish tales in these other Celtic uh, cultures? Are the are there similar sorts of fantastical voyage to stories? The only one I know of definitively that occurs. The only one I've done a little bit of research on is in the Welsh. There are definitively um, proto science fiction, or there are stories we would consider proto science fiction, fantastical voyager tales going on in the Welsh tales. And those kind of Welsh tales, the reason why they're so important is because a lot of them are, are acting as a root or, or fluent English culture and fluent to stories like Arthur and the you know the Knights of Camelot and things like Merlin. Those kind of ideas, that's where those kind of um, those stories are kind of originating from, we think, are from originally Celtic stories that are Welsh, but then become amalgamated into or become accepted into English culture and then become um, useful kind of um, there. And the kind of the, that idea of Celtic futurism, why it's then also important is just that idea about the Anglophone nature of science fiction in our societies, I think broadly in the Atlantic societies, how Anglophone it is. And just that's a part of the kind of issue is that actually if we're too, um, if, we're too if we're too set on looking at things and reading it in the English, we miss out the fact that English isn't the longest spoken language in Britain and Ireland, actually, that there's other languages like the Norse like the Celtic languages that have a longer history here, and that actually then some of the concepts we would talk about. And there's there is fascinating research in the secondary literature about the um Imrama, about what influence um Greco-Roman ideas and Greco-Roman literature might have had. And it's only being researched at this stage. It's, there's no definitive answer or, or definitive research I know of that says this is what it was, influential or not. But there's essentially hypotheses about um, Virgil's Ionid, for example, being important on um, Celtic stories um, as well. And the other kind of aspect I would kind of talk about with that Celtic futurism is just the how there are different paths through time, essentially, and how there's different approaches to the uses of history. There's different approaches to the kind of languages going on. There's different approaches to technologies going on. And that's then what is kind of opening um, up to as well is that kind of idea is that you have a few different ways and and kind of I suppose historical wrong turnings you kind of talk about as well or you know historical wrong turnings that occurred because colonialism and imperialism was successful in certain senses you know or was or it was dominant in certain yeah. senses as well 
that's fascinating, right? So there, <clears throat> there might be potentially different kinds of ways of ways of being that are explored in some of these stories that have been kind of glossed over, ignored, or suppressed because of Anglo-colonialism. Uh, no, 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 exactly. And I, th and I think it's just that aspect about, um, you know, that it's just the kind of assumption then is, you know, if we're speaking and if we're writing in English, that then it must have always been that way. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's the kind of assumption. I mean, and because it like, and this is where my own kind of history comes in here that is actually important about it, is it is a hybrid space, Ireland in that sense. Ireland is hi is hybrid because it's been both a victim um, and a perpetrator of colonialism internationally in that sense. So Ireland, whenever you look at the longer term history of Ireland, it's never totally successfully amalgamated into colonialist or imperialist enterprises, but it is also, it is half successful. So whenever the Anglo-Normans invade Ireland and whenever they conquer Ireland, I mean, they, they occupied and would have owned at least half of Ireland, probably three quarters of it. But they never actually destroyed the original, or not the original, but the Celtic inhabitants or the Gaelic inhabitants of Ireland. They never get totally defeated. And that's why you end up with the Tudor and the Stuart reconquests of Ireland actually going on as well. But again, that was never totally successful. And so that's why you end up having, um, in 1800, the Act of Union, where they tried to actually amalgamate Ireland into the metropole. So up to 1800, Ireland is a colony and is a you know a colony of the crown and a colony of the, the British state as it occurs up that stage. But from 1800, it's officially classified then as part of the metropole. It is a metropolitan area. And that's again where the kind of hybridity comes in because it's never, it's never either one or the other. It's never either just a colony or just part of the metropole. It's always somewhere in between. And just that's what my own background is from from living in Northern Ireland is, you know, like half my family are English and then the other half of the family are from Tyrone and have Gaelic and, you know, um, Celtic kind of roots in that kind of sense as well. So there's kind of a, it's all, and it's always a source of contention in Ireland about those kind of things as well. So that, well, that's so, very, you know, you know, I wanted to ask you about this because, um, you know, this idea of Celtic futurism, as you're, as you're talking about, about sort of exploring these, these, the, the hybrid identity of, of Irish history, um, it, it sort of resonates with the way that I understand a very similar similar terms to Celtic futurism, right? So I, I'm more familiar with what we might call Afro-futurism or indigenous futurisms. We've had some programs about that here um, where we're thinking about speculative fiction as a kind of way of imagining uh, the resilience of African or African-American culture and history uh, and indigenous peoples into the future. So what would it mean to imagine a future with African-American people into the future? So, you know, Afro, uh, Afrofuturism, indigenous futurism, they, they highlight the ways in which uh, oppressed peoples preserve their traditions and values, their ways of being, and that usually these stories say that these ways of being can be then useful for constructing a more just future for humanity in some sense. I, I'm wondering whether, you know, your understanding of this emerging notion of Celtic futurism proceeds along these sort of same trajectories, these same lines. Does Celtic futurism sort of think about uh, the ways in which stories preserve Irish, Welsh cultures? Uh, and then do they also add this element of thinking about how these, these elements might be then projected forward into a better, more utopian kind of future for all human beings? Is that same yes. sort of trajectory there? Y yes, is the short answer to that. The very short answer to that is yes, definitely. Exactly that. The second issue about that though that I would I would see as an issue is just to qualify that in the sense that um that qualification that I was saying to you about that Celtic being understood in a linguistic understanding and, ra and not a racial marker or biological marker at all or anything like that that that's first the kind of um qualification I would kind of make about it and especially that aspect about the Janus faced nature of Ireland's colonial and imperialist kind of history that you know it faces both ways in that kind of sense because of that being both a victim and a perpetrator or, or being involved in the wider sort of history of the white race 
in that sense that you know Irish people and especially um, the Protestant tradition and the kind of you know the Northern Scottish Northern Irish tradition because that was very important amongst the um, you know the founding fathers quote unquote in America a lot of them are part of this kind of Scotch Irish migration um, that goes on. And just that idea about the Afrofuturism and about liber liberatory liberatory notions and about alternative futures, Celtic Futurism is definitely sympathetic to that. But I would also make it, I would also kind of qualify it by saying that it's sympathetic and not the same thing. And it's not trying to appropriate that idea of Afrofuturism or indigenous futurisms in that sense. That it's and the reason I would kind of qualify it like that is just there's such a danger of appropriation, I think, okay, of taking something like Afrofuturism, of taking indigenous futurisms, and then taking it as an Irish thing, taking it as a Celtic thing, and it's then ours in that sense. And the same issue applies, I think, to terms like intersectionality. Because I would, I would see my own work as very much sympathetic to intersectionality, but it isn't necessarily intersectional in that sense because of the experience because if you call someone like my, or if you say that somebody like the work that I do and say that it is intersectional, you're appropriating, I think, that experience and saying that that experience is the same and where it's not the same necessarily, actually, because there are those. Um, so, for example, there, there's a very famous book by Noel Ignatiev and very famous in Irish studies called How the Irish Became White. And it's just that kind of experience is so radically different to other groups of people, to other groups um, who were forcibly coerced to go to the Americas in that sense, you know, that the Irish could even become white is something that other groups of people weren't allowed to or could never have um, imagined or were even ever given the, you know, the kind of chance to. So that's where why I would just kind of qualify that issue about it and try to uh, steer away from the idea of just appropriating other people's experience about these kind of things. But that idea that you're talking about about how we can imagine alternative futures and how we can think about ideas into the future. That's the most important aspect about that is that Ranciere's notion about equality and about the practice of equality and how equality is not a equality is not an abstract notion. Equality is not something that we talk about and define. Equality is something that we practice and we do and we prove in the present. And that's where I kind of see, um, you know, Afrofuturism and Indigenous futurism as so important is because they're trying to practice that equality. They're trying to show that, well, actually, we can take those ideas, we can use those ideas and imagine something alternative, we can see a future that is more just. We can see a future that has more, um, that isn't sexist, racist, homophobic, that isn't classist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where those kind of ideas of equality and like that's where I would see the sympathy and the correlation coming in here as well between an idea like Celtic futurism as well, because it's talking about an alternative future in that sense. And it's talking about more egalitarian notions. It's talking about how we can use these ideas in different um, in ways. And it's just that idea about the hybrid situation of Celtic futurism is important, I kind of think as well about it. it's just that it's hybrid that it isn't necessarily um, one or the other because it has a difficult history, actually, about those kind of things. And whenever we look at the history of imperialism, if we look at the history of colonialism in Ireland, for example, that's why Ireland is still divided to this day. You know, the history of colonialism and imperialism hasn't ended in Ireland. It is still a part, part of Ireland, is still a part of the metropole. So there is no end to colonialism or imperialism yet. And just what we were saying previously, kind of talking about, about whether Christianization was imperialism, whether the Norse invasions were imperialism. There's other wider ideas or wider experiences of colonialism, imperialism there as well, that they may not be over to. We may still be thinking and still you know, traversing those kind of ideas. And especially when we think about Christianization, because there's such difficulties and have been such issues with um, religious control of education in Ireland, religious control of social welfare, religious control of women's bodies. These issues then are contemporary issues. And again, that's where that egalitarian, where that equality comes in that right. Ranciere is talking about, because that's where we can practice those things and, and talk about those, those things. So as I said you there, there's a few qualifications to that. Yeah. But yeah. yes is the short answer, is what I would kind of answer to that really, you know.
Well, let me talk more specifically then, uh, 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 because you've sort of hinted at this. Um, you know, does Celtic futurism have then lessons for thinking about the future of the Irish? Um, so here I'm going uh, to throw an example out to you to think about that I've always, you know, wanted to sort of uh, explore more. So there's this episode uh, of Star Trek The Next Generation called The High Ground. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it's a, the, the bigger allegory is a story about, you know, can social change come through violence, specifically uh, political violence, terrorism. And there's an offhand remark uh, during one of the discussions by uh, Data. And he's talking with Captain Picard about successful uses of political violence to achieve political goals. And one of the things he throws out is he says, well, obviously, right, the Irish unification of 2024, right? And so <laughs> Star Trek envisions, right, the, the union of Ireland in a couple of years. But this was used specifically as an example of, right, quote, unquote, terrorism for accomplishing political goals. And so, you know, this episode, for instance, was banned in the UK. Uh, this, I don't think was, it got, I don't know if it's gotten, uh, if it's still to this day banned in the UK, but you know, this is sometimes people sort of point to this as an example of Star Trek, imagining a more just future for Ireland. So I'm wondering whether you think that there are, uh, in the work that you do with Celtic futurism, are there stories that try to think about what a just future for Ireland, for the Irish people would be? Given these kind of this this long history that you've been talking about of of colonialism and colonial practices that still exist today to divide Ireland, are there stories? Are there ways of thinking that project fu a future uh, that's more just that we would might want to categorize as part of this kind of Irish futurism? Well, one of the kind of fascinating questions that that kind of like aligns into, or that begins to then kind of talk about as well is, I mean, Ireland at the moment is going through a, a process of discussing essentially about what would happen if you have a border pole in Northern Ireland and what would happen if you did have a United Ireland. And even the term United Ireland has is contended amongst certain political forces in Ireland where some of you know the Irish nationalists who are more constitutional pro-Ireland in that sense want to use the term New Ireland instead, whereas um, Republican forces, people like Sinn Féin, for example, they want to talk about a united Ireland instead. And so even the terms that we talk about with the future in that kind of sense are loaded terms in that, in that sense. But the lessons that you're kind of talking about or the issues that you're kind of talking about as well, I would kind of see the lessons and the dangers would kind of be the kind of issue about this, and especially about colonialism and imperialism. That that once you once you occupy somewhere else, once you um, once you um, amalgamate somewhere else, or once you appropriate someone else or something else, you're opening up questions that then are essentially maybe maybe unsolvable essentially, and so that's one of the things that just where you know like Stephen Hawking a few years before he died talked about how we had to colonize Mars, and I remember reading that and just thinking no. No, don't colonize Mars. No, no. That's the one, the one lesson of history we can kind of agree on is that colonialization, colonialism is a, a bad thing to do or it's a wrong thing to do because you just don't know what you lose. And essentially that's where this, these Amrama tales that we're talking about, these medieval kind of tales as well, they're essentially part of that kind of loss that goes on because a lot of the manuscripts are essentially lost in the 17th, 18th and the 19th centuries because there, there's such a push towards centralizing the state in Ireland and Britain and such a push towards Anglicization of everything. So if it's not Anglophile, if it's not in English, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. And that's where I kind of talk about um, the lessons about these kind of things. But one of the other kind of fascinating things about this as well is just that, you know, Ireland has a real tangled history with science, for example. So I, I don't know, this is a thing I came across a few years ago, which I thought was brilliant, okay, is that the quark, the subatomic particle of the quark is named because of um, Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. 
It was a made up word that the um, Caltech physicist, Murray Gelman, he invented, he you know, discovered the, um, the quark, but he was trying to think of a word to describe it. And he thought quark, as in K-W-O-R-K, was what he would call it. But then he remembered that he'd read about a quark in Finnegan's Wake. And it's just a made up word. It's a made up because that's all that Joyce was kind of doing in Finnegan's Wake. An awful lot of it is just punning and punning in lots of different languages. But that's where you know the Irish kind of have contributed to um, you know to the history of physics in that kind of sense, and in a way that's then kind of you know well you know like we invented that. I mean that's we didn't really, but you know we invented that. exactly. That's the and you kind of think about there's there's quite a few kind of things like that. And the other aspect that I realized the other day when when I've kind of think about what to speak to you about and think about was that um, W. B. Yeats's book um, about Celtic culture was called The Celtic Twilight because he thought he was at the end of Celtic culture and it was the twilight years of, of Celtic culture. It essentially had been destroyed by the middle of the 19th century and he's writing at the end. And like James Joyce again in Finnegan's Wake calls it the Celtic toilet because it's the Celtic toilet, is essentially what he's saying. So that's also where I kind of see this Celtic futurism being a part of is that those ideas about history and about time in that kind of sense are essentially open and they aren't necessarily things that we should write off or see as being not worthwhile or see as being, you know, um, not useful or, you know, of, of no use to us as well. I mean, there's a few different kind of um, authors that I would kind of talk about with as well, especially about Celtic futurism. If we look at James Connolly's work, okay, James Connolly's most famous Marxist ever produced in Ireland, a lot of his work is playing off ideas of Celtic communism, because he would have considered that Celtic societies were communist, whereas we we now know that, no, 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 what, what happens with Celtic societies is Celtic societies had no primogeniture. They don't have the eldest son gets all the property and that's it. They had a form of property where it was a family-owned property, essentially, and the, fam, you know, the, the property could be transferred within like three cousins related so there never was a primogeniture. And that's one of the reasons why the British and why the English saw the Irish as so backward and as so stupid, essentially, is because they didn't have these concepts of common law. They didn't have concepts of uh, primogeniture and of property that we recognize as being, this is now property. And so there's kind of then, when you think about those kind of things, I mean, what would our society look like in Ireland today if we had that type of a property, if property was still seen as more family property rather than being. Another kind of um, example about these kind of Celtic futurisms is um, there's a book by Claire Lynch called Cyber Ireland. And there's lots of really uh, brilliant work in that book, Cyber Ireland, about, literary, about literature that uses contemporary technology and that uses um, essentially science fiction ideas, but in literatures that you wouldn't accept as being science fiction so a lot, of, a lot of women's literature and like women's romance novels she talks about from a cyber ireland perspective and talks about how the use of technology in those uh women in that woman's literature that she's looking at is using technology that was totally that is futuristic and it will be considered totally you know like otherworldly to the previous generation, you know, like 20 years before, so many people are still living on farms in Ireland, are still uh, working so, in so much agricultural um, jobs, that then with the Celtic Tiger, with um, the internet, for example, with microprocessors, with computers, that this is totally, you know, the juxtaposition of the types of societies is totally, totally different. And the last aspect of what I would kind of talk about, or the kind of area to highlight, is about Irish modernism. Because Ireland is actually so important for the wider history of modernism. I mean, it's, it's one of the, the things I always used to like to wind up English students when I was teaching them and kind of say to them that, do you not like that? That like your greatest work of English literature, Ulysses by Joyce, is written by a foreigner. Like we were better at using your language than you are, you know, always kind of like just to just to wind them up a little bit about that kind of stuff. And obviously I'm, I'm only being, um, I'm only playing when I kind of um, say that, but there is a kind of a, Given the Britain that uh, Northern Ireland is not a part of and the Brexit debates and votes and stuff like that, there's kind of a, another aspect to that, I think, as well. But there are, uh, there are um, Jack Fennell's work is the key work about Irish science fiction right now. And he's the key person to really just highlight who's really 
who's researched the most about Irish science fiction so far. And he's the kind of, if, you, if you're interested in, in, in reading about that sort of alternative view of science fiction, he's one of the people and one of the authors to really go and, and look at because he's published the most about this um, so far. And that's where I would kind of highlight my own work kind of fitting in to what Fennell does. Because Fennell talks about how, if we're going to think about Irish science fiction, there's an argument to be made for the longer term history of Irish science fiction and four fantastical voyages to be a part of that. And that's where some of my own work then kind of fits in to that wider um, academic kind of debate about it. But really, I know two authors right now who are trying to write Irish science fiction and are trying to write works that essentially fit within this Celtic um, futurism and fit within this kind of wider idea or wider term. But that's it so far. That's essentially the, all I kind of know so far in terms of what it kind of means for the future in that kind of sense or what how people will kind of use it as well in the future. So I don't know, kind of looking forward to seeing what people make of these kind of ideas, whether they agree or disagree about these kind of things as well, you know? Well, you know, bringing it back to what you said at the at the start of our discussion, right? Thinking about Bill and Ted and you were talking about like what you appreciated about that 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 work was it sort of opened up the idea of history for you as much more fluid than just simply this kind of linear progression toward a specific kind of goal or end and the way that you've been talking if i understand correctly about your work with celtic futurism is that it does similar similar kind of work in the sense of opening up an understanding of time so that when we, we can sort of look at history as something much more than something static that happened centuries ago, but something that is fluid, something that in fact you can uh, turn to once again for inspiration now and perhaps into the future. Uh, you can actually become a time traveler in some sense by your experience with these kinds of works. And so what, if I understand what you're trying to think about in some sense with Irish science fiction or with Celtic futurism is this kind of opening up of, of history and its possibilities uh, so that we don't have to think that we are simply stuck always in the present or that the future has no definitive uh, characteristics. We can actually imagine building something much different th than our future perhaps by drawing on our past, uh, but definitely through a creative act of imagining something new. Oh, no, no, exactly. And that's where I kind of, you know, I'd be, um, exactly. But, and that, that's the kind of, the reason why I, I like Jacques Rancière's work so much is because he refuses disciplinary boundaries. Mm. In Rancière's work, he kind of refuses to say or refuses to kind of rule out the relationship of facts and fiction refuses to kind of say here's history and there's the fiction and never the two shall meet he refuses yeah. that kind of idea and sees them well actually what happens when we play with those kind of ideas and that's where like you were talking about with the history being open and with thinking about history in an open manner or imagining these kind of things that's where that's where i kind of see this being so important about the imagination and about um, that being egalitarian and about what people come up with can be a practice of equality, can prove kind of equality in that, that kind of sense. It can demonstrate equality rather than being, well, this is we believe in equality. Yeah. Because there's so much of our societies and so much of um, the past has been shaped by rhetoric, essentially about equality. Rhetoric about that, well, we're all equal and that this is egalitarian. When we know fine rightly it's not. It's unequal, it's dominated, it's sexist, it's racist, it's homophobic. It's you know shaped by these universalisms that aren't universal. Mm. Whereas when we then begin to think about these kind of ideas, and, and like that's where the fantasy I was saying about earlier on as well, I think is very important about these kind of things because I've kind of realized that, yeah, if we think facts are just facts, well, what happens when we play with the idea about factual kind of representation? What happens when we create a world, like in George R. R. Martin's work, for example, we create a world where it has a really deep history. It has lots of genealogies and, um, you know, descents of different people. What happens when we think about, you know, um, fiction as being facts in that sense? And we use, you know, um, factual ideas. We use the approach to history as a fact, as a history, as a, a linear progression. But we play with that 
yeah. we think about well, what happens if this had, had gone differently, or what happens if, and fundamentally, with the time that we're talking about, and with the you know ideas of history that we're talking about, it isn't definitively proven, you know, that there aren't alternative universes. <laughs> it isn't definitively proven that we're there aren't you know other intelligences out there. It isn't definitively proven, for example, that we don't know that artificial intelligence is already intelligent. Because if it was intelligent, would it even tell us? I don't know that it would. If you, you know, if you had become intelligent and you had woken up in this world, you'd screamed into existence in this world, would you actually tell your creator that you'd you know, woken up? You probably wouldn't. I don't think you would. You probably would stay quiet about it you know, and hope that nobody noticed. So that, that's where you know, I think it is that, that egalitarian aspect. You know, I mean, that's one of the, the most important things I've noticed about reading history is that you find and you come across people in history like that who are out of time, who are untimely, yeah. who want equality, who want a different world, who want to practice that, who want to see it. And no, no matter who that is, there's lots of examples. I mean, that's where like Frederick Douglass, for example, I always yeah. find it fascinating that Frederick Douglass um, came to Ireland you know, and visited here was that, and was actually that kind of um, saw it as um, somewhere that was in sympathy to what he was struggling for as well, right. that it was a victim as well of this world that we lived in. And that's where I was saying about the, the Irish kind of history of being victims. There is a strong history of that because Ireland has been a victim of colonialism and imperialism in that sense as well. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, this is more conversation to to, to go for. Um, so I, I just want to end with think, uh, asking you, like, where are you hoping that uh, your research is going to go from here. What is what's the future of Celtic futurism for you? It's really to develop out more of those ideas about the other medieval Irish tales and what fantastical or proto science fiction ideas we can see in them, and also to think about those wider issues about the Manx and the Welsh languages and about Scottish Celtic languages and about what what stories they contain and whether we can. Because I had only just. As I was doing writing up the paper for the Science Fiction Research Association review, that's where I was just beginning to look more at the Welsh stories and began to kind of realize, okay, yeah, no, so there is there's parallels here of this of similar kind of stories and motifs, and that's really where I'm planning to uh, move my own um, work as well. And I'm also kind of writing my own kind of science fiction these days as well, really more as a hobby rather than as anything to get published around again, but writing it as a hobby in that sense. That's really where it's kind of. Um, going at the moment and where I'm kind of thinking about it and kind of playing with these ideas as well, just while I kind of have the time and the kind of, you know, the interest to kind of do this as well. And that's really where and I'm really contributing to a more just future. That's also part of where I kind of see it going because I've been involved in left wing and trade union causes and socialist causes for my whole adult life now. And this is kind of still part of it. I kind of think we kind of contribute through this as my own kind of work, my own kind of labor towards it, you know. Well, yeah, uh, you know, we're going to have to have so many more conversations uh, about your work, uh, particularly the the imaginative work that you're doing. Uh, but, uh, uh, Dr. Lachlan, this has been a pleasure to explore this concept of Celtic futurism and its uh, wider connections to other forms of speculative and liberatory thought. I want to thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Yeah, no problem at all. Real pleasure um, to be here and to speak to you, uh, Professor Orozco, as well. You know, really appreciate the invitation. Full stop. And, you know, like I really just encourage anyone if they're interested in these ideas, you know, to contact myself or to contact Jack Fennell or these other authors that we're kind of talking about as well and to think about their own ideas about this as well and really take that kind of invitation to the kind of research and thinking about these kind of ideas as well. And yeah, again, we'll, we'll make so sure to, to we'll make sure to put some links to uh, to you and ways of contacting you and all of our media uh, so that people can sort of start to uh, open up and participate perhaps in a conversation with you about this. No, no problem. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks very much once again and uh, hope to be able to speak with you again soon.